dozvolite da započnemo današnji rad sesiji solarna energija. Zahvaljujem se na dolazku učešću. Želo bi da pozdravim goste koje imamo na ovoj konferenciji. Imamo predstavnike iz Tirane, iz gradskih urbanista, predstavnici AFC-a iz kancelarije iz Tirane. Imamo naše drage kolege iz Banja Luke koji su prisutni, imamo predstavnike Toplana Srbije, nadam se da će nam se još priključiti tokom same konferencije još učesnika. Današnja tema vrlo specifična, razvijamo projekat solarno grejanje u Beogradu, inicijativa do koje smo došli upravo boraveći na međunarodnim konferencijama, a upoznavanje sa samim projektom dogodilo se upravo u Gracu i ovde su i naj... odnosno predstavnici upravo i tvorci ovakvog projekta iz Gracu. Imaćemo priliku da vidimo projekte koji će se koji će se realizovati u Gracu a također vidjet ćemo i projekat koji će biti realizovati ovde u Neogradu. Dajem reč kolegi Bogdanoviću da krenemo sa današnjom sesijom. Svi govornici imat će prezenteri priliku 20 minuta da govore, potom dozvoljavamo 5 minuta postavljanje pitanja i diskusiju, a naravno po završetku svih prezentacija imat ćemo mogućnost da razgovaramo o ono o čemu ćemo pričati, ono što ćemo vidjeti na samim prezentacijama pa i o nekim iskustvima koje već imamo u Srbiji na temu korišćenja solarne energije u sistemima daljinskog vreda. Izvolite kolega Bogdanoviću. Hvala. Kao priliku da otvori današnji naš sastanak i ovaj radni deo će imati kolega Kristijan Holter, direktor firme Solid sa predavanjem solarna energija kao gorivo za danijansko gre. Izvolite da smo na potrebu. Good morning everyone, I switch to English. Uh, so, thanks for the uh, introduction. I'm uh, founder and director of the Austrian company Solid. Uh, we are focused on solar uh, thermal energy and we are working on the city level, infrastructure level, big buildings level. So we do not do the one to family houses, but everything which goes to large scale. And um, my talk for opening this se session is actually saying solar energy as a fuel for district heating. And I want to guide you a little bit the way how we came into this concept, how we came into these ideas, and work through that jointly with you. So, first of all, I would like to understand a little bit where are you from to specify my messages. So. Who is from Serbia here? Okay, so there's a lot of other nationalities present. <laughs> yeah, Who is here? For Bosnia. Yeah. Bosnia? For Bosnia? Okay. Yes. Some other? Albania. Albania, good, yes. Slovenia, great. Okay, Austria. <laughs> so, and, <laughs> and, and you see, the more we get south for sure, the more solar resources we have. So this is one side which helps solar systems. There's another part, uh, the more we get south, uh, the heating profiles change because uh, the heating season is sometimes getting a little bit shorter. If we go more into the eastern climates, we have more the extremely cold coming in from the east sometimes. So each of these places is a little bit of different needs and, and frame conditions in regards of district heating the on the one hand and on solar energy resources on the other hand. And uh, another quick question, who of you is directly involved in district heating? Okay, so there's several people around. Now, okay, we all know that heating is a major, or heat generally is a real major part in current energy uh, consumption. The OECD numbers is something like roughly 50% heat, 30% mobility, 20% electricity. And when we talk about transition of energy systems, so much in our daily politics discussion is focused on electricity or mobility. 
and I really think we need to highlight the importance of heat as a major uh, target to be tackled in the next years. And if you look on current infrastructures, especially in cities, uh, what are your heat sources you are using today? Electricity? Gas? No one using coal? It is coal, yes. Wood? Pellet. But if you look on the overall scope of district heating, especially when you look on bigger cities today, the vast majority is also based. So it's each city has its own story for sure, but if you make a general picture, I would say it's 90% plus. And if you want to convert the heating into renewables, uh, we need to wait. We need to move away from where we are today. And well, you all know this is not just having one truck of wood chips or one panel of solar. We are talking on really, really, really big demands and big, big uh, numbers we need for that. So, uh, okay, what would be your ideas for moving this big amounts into renewables? I have heard good already. Other ideas? <coughs> Biomass, wood, yeah? Okay. Heat pump. Heat pump. Okay, so let me tell you a little bit what happened in our hometown Graz uh, and what we learned there. Yeah. Today the district heating there is coming 85% out of the co-generation plant, which is actually, well, it's two co-generation plants, one is running with coal, the other one with natural gas. And it's operated by separate ownership. So it's not a district heating company having ownership, but a separate one. And as we have a massive increase of renewable electricity in Europe, the electricity prices in the Austrian German market dropped significantly. And so the company operating the coaching said, gosh, we originally had 60, 70, 80 euro per megawatt hour electricity as sales price. Now we are down to 30. This business case doesn't make sense anymore. And send a nice letter to the city mayor saying, you know, our contract of heat supply expires in early 2020. We give you notice, we will not extend our operation of the plants. So within to receiving one letter, the city knew we are losing 85% of the current heat supply. And so we started the process in the city of Graz with involvement of for sure the energy companies, but as well with the city, with the local government, with universities, with private companies, with consultants okay, what can we do to compensate that? And as you can imagine, the wish list was a big one. District heating needs to keep low prices. Otherwise, it's not competitive, it's not socially responsible to use that. For sure, no one wants to be dependent on, or have increased dependency on oil or gas or something coming from far away. No one wants to have a new generation system based on fossil fuels. So the vision is possible actually everything you can imagine, cheap energy without environmental impact falls, but you know, practically, we need to find some compromises on that. And having all these uh, people sitting together, there were something like 200 proposals that came on the table that were evaluated in detail in close cooperation, saying what can we do on that? And I wanna go through some highlights with you, which are transferable experiences for other places. So, biomass for sure was a topic coming up quite quickly. What can we do with biomass? And we needed some numbers to talk about 1,000 gigawatt hours which are missing just in the city of Graz. And we said, okay, if we produce this 1,000 gigawatt hours with biomass, what is about the resources for that? We do have a lot of uh, medium-sized small villages uh, that already work with biomass district heating. And so there are the resources we have in biomass there's some free capacity, so we checked through that, but it was very clear if you want to take 1,000 gigawatt hour biomass on addition, you need a circle of 200 kilometers around Graz to supply that. And, you know, well, Graz Vienna is 200 kilometers, so it means we need to take all the biomass from Vienna and from Maribor as well, and almost all Vienna just to supply Graz. Well, okay, we can do something on that, and actually there are some smaller installations which come up at the city border to uh, feed in a little bit of biomass, 
property prosperity, biomass will not be the sole source for taking responsibility to replace all the things we're missing from uh, what we lose on the cooperation side. So, next, uh, I put that in here, here's thermal energy. Yes, but we don't have that in many places. We do have it in new places in Europe with the privilege of having hot uh, spots underneath the city or close to it, but it's not a common uh, applicable concept. Then, we heard heat pumps. Well, there's a lot of potential where people say, yes, we do have low-grade waste. We do have groundwater, we can take out heat. We have rivers we could cool down. So there was a lot of calculation and thinking about what can you do with, with, with uh, heat pumps. And actually, or we do have the wastewater plant, which has some potential of taking out heat. And summarizing all these evaluations, yes, there's a little thing you can do, but there are three clear limitations. Number one, if you run a heat pump, especially electric one, you need to have electricity to run that. And if you want to change several hundred megawatts, heat supply to a heat pump driven system, you need quite a significant chunk of electricity. We don't have this electricity available easily, but even worse, if you produce that as additional electricity, you're back to fossil sources because we cannot extend our renewable electricity within a moment in this amount. So we need to go back and say, okay, if you run heat pumps, honestly spoken, that will be fossil driven, might be a lot in the renewable energy. Second part is the heat pumps actually uh, operate well if you run them 8,000 hours a year on some base load. That's the best for the economics. Um, but the need is the troubles is more the winter period. So uh, the match between base load and peak demand, uh, this is nothing where the heat pump is a really good uh, support. Then, next challenge, uh, district heating and supply temperatures in many central European cities are far higher than we have it here. We do operate uh, 110, 120, 130 degrees C still as a supply line. And we all know that for heat pumps, the uh, electric COP is getting quite, quite tough on these supply temperatures. So, at the end of the day, we said, well, the heat pump, it looks attractive, but honestly, it's neither the amount of energy which significantly helps the district heating system, nor do we have the driving energy in a green, sustainable way available to use that as a big source. Again, there will be a few plans, so I suppose one plan taking waste heat from the city's sewage uh, water might come up, but we're talking here about 2-3% of the overall load, and it's a nice to have, but it's not the strategy to win the game. So, it's not easy to convert all the heat into renewables. And uh, one thing I want to take here as well, we all are aware there's a lot of general discussion going on about electrification of heating and cooling. So many uh, political programs actually say, yeah, we simply make enough electricity on the renewable side and use that for heating. But honestly, if you compare a little bit uh, the market sizes of heating and electricity, so you see the red part is heating cooling, the blue part is electricity. If we simply switch uh, heating to the electric market, I have no idea how that should work. We do have in the European scale that they have approximately 80% of the electricity is still coming out of fossil fuels and nuclear. So everything we add on on the electric side is not really a renewable supply for us. And I think we really need to be very clear that electrification of heating and cooling does not contribute to sustainable uh, energy supply. So, what about solar? And I can tell you, frankly speaking, we do have a long track of uh, working with these two heating companies in solar energy. We started that with supplying the summer load, which is the easy low-hanging fruit. But when you talk about, gosh, we take care of the winter load, people say, eh, summer, sun, solar profile, winter heating demand, how can that match? We all know peak load from November, December until February, March. Profile of Graz. Well, the solar profile it is exactly the opposite one. And what is the way to close this gap? Now, 
for else. Easy thinking is okay, let's take a storage, put in the solar heat wave from summer and take it out in winter. Is it something which is feasible and uh, can we do that? Well, we are not talking here on steel tanks as you've seen in the previous picture, we're talking on a totally different concept. Uh, so this is a storage how it's currently operating in Denmark. But coming back to the visibility, I can give you a very nice personal story on that. When I started my professional career, I was working in environment analysis, environment management, and I said, I cannot be the oil heating system in my house when I'm talking on environmental impact and analyze all that. And I started in the late 80s to say, I want to be the solar heating system here. And I built the system, you see here my house and the Google Earth picture, solar collectors on the roof. And on the right side, you see a uh, second building, which actually was a stable, because all that was a farmhouse originally. Now, I put three big tanks into this stable out of the brewery. I heat them up with the solar in summer, and I use that for space heating. So I made a kind of mini system with seasonal storage. Uh, and this operates since 1992 now, and I have a personal long-term track of performance with that. It was an R&D project, it was a pilot project, and uh, at that time we built it everyone as well. But it's nice to show, see how it works, but it never ever will be economically feasible. Today, looking back on 25 years um, operation, I cover something like 70-80% of my space heating demand with that system. The remaining is wood for my own garden, and the little bit of wood I was had to purchase is 2,000 euros in 25 years. So today I would say, yes, there's some return of investment, but still, this is not the way to go on large scale. But if you see it works even in such a crazy template situation, there's a way to go to the next. Now. If we talk about solar energy, everyone says yes, but you need a lot of space to put the collectors on. And in a way it's true, we need a lot of space because solar radiation per square meter has a certain annual potential, we can use it. So thermal energy can use 50-60% of that today, but still uh, it's something like 4 gigawatt hours per hectare we can collect here in these climates and there's yeah, simply not more we can take out of that. So, what is the scaling on that in comparison to other things? And if you compare to, to other infrastructure we have in cities, uh, a solar system to cover, and these numbers out of the broad system, is in the same range as an uh, existing power plant, is in the same range as two highway uh, connection points. It is something like one third of the airport we do have. So it's not that you say it's something totally extraordinary, but for sure you need to find a place, and it might have been a lot easier to find a place 20, 30 years ago when, when developments of cities were not really up to date. Important comparison to biomass. You see here a green line uh, going around uh, this slide, and you see the yellow spot which has the uh, word solar in it. This is what we need for the solar, <coughs> compared to what we would need getting the same amount of energy out of biomass if you have a short-term over biomass and you actually need a total slide if you go for normal grown wood. So we have a factor of 30 to short-term biomass in regards of energy density with a factor of almost 60 compared to normal grown biomass. So that is quite a good usage of area compared to that technology. Now, so what we did, and I will not go on the details here, I just want to show you the, the possibilities. Uh, Robert Searle will go into the detail, details of the grants project later on. In the grants project we have some limitations. We do have, I told you, high supply temperature. We do have high return temperatures as well. And this is a key hurdle for getting high solar fractions. In the grants project we can do something like 20% with the current uh, district heating and it's really limited by the heat, by the supply and return temperature. But this is definitely not the end of where we can go. We do have uh, small cities in Denmark which have much more advanced district heating systems which have something like 50-60% solar fraction and it's simply they use supply 70 to 80, return 30 to 40 and immediately you can go up to 50 or 60%. And I want to go to a small community in Canada, it's called Great Landing. It is a new-built 
development to only 40 houses, so it's not distributed in the graph for sure, but it shows where we can go. They made a really good distribution system, what you can do when you make one plot of new development, and they have built the underground storage, they have built several collectors on the garages of the buildings. And this project is now in operation in the 11th period. <coughs> it's in Calgary, Canada, having twice as much heat in three days than Central Europe. In the last three years, they had 100% solar fraction on the space heating and on the hot water. And in the beginning, they were a little bit lower, so the storage lost a little bit to the ambient, and then today you have a balance between the losses and a little bit of flowing back. And yes, this is a very extreme example, but it shows you where we can go. And the vision when you use solar as fuel for district heating is we have projects to start with, like RAS with 20%, 25%. What we can do today. We have systems which are much, much better supply and return than we today are capable of doing 50 or 60 percent. And we could go, but we all know this is a 20 to 30 years development already, uh, which we can achieve. We can go actually much higher. And it will not go in any discussion. If it's really 100 percent in the place, we do have other resources to complement. But I want to take that as a good example where we can go. So the summary is. We do see that in the projects which have 20 to 58 percent solar coverage today, we have economic competitiveness to existing energy prices of gas, etc. We do have a system that provides energy when it's needed, and that's a key for district heating because sun in summer is nice, but we need in winter here. We do have security of supply, and I think this is a very important one for the future, which has not been highlighted a lot in the past. A colleague of us just has a presentation, had a presentation yesterday in Washington DC, talking about the resilience of heating systems. How can we get more safety of supply, whatever happens in the world market? We are depending on so many external factors today. Having a solar heating system here with long-term storage, you have a high grade of independence from that. Okay, here we and last but not least at all, we have a long term price stability. So, when I talked to uh, district heating director in Austria just last week, he said, you know, if we take out uh, the grant, you know, the solar energy cost us maybe. 5 or 10 percent more than natural gas, which is really cheap at the moment. But we know we have one investment which currently is a 30 years stable energy costs, and uh, we can hedge this risk more or less by accepting a little bit higher costs today. And we easily can explain it to our shareholders saying, look, this is a kind of insurance policy buying into this as well. So, when we had achieved this level of commitment, the utility here, you see here the CEO of, of Energy Steiermark, which is our region, the utility went public with this concept. We got front pages of newspapers, and all this solar district heating got a lot of respect and attention. And I would say the past project is starting to be paved nicely. We are still in a phase where we need to create the understanding, the awareness, and we all know projects developing in energy infrastructure, nothing is happening from today to tomorrow. We do need time to talk to the decision makers, we do need some time to secure the land, uh, we do need time to get the permits and to go into implementation, but um, I think this road, we are all together walking down this road slowly, and I think we will have very nice uh, opportunities quite soon. So, Thanks for your attention and I need your attention. Thank you, Mr. Hall.